as we know, one of the big hot topics in, in conversations in the public and at large. Um, and what I think, I just want to say briefly that um, many people probably during education don't know that it, standardized testing hasn't been until the last maybe 40 or so years associated with evaluating school and, and certainly not with teacher performance. Teacher performance became part of standardized testing um, with no child left behind. It was, it, was, it was just a matter of diagnostic, it's a matter of assessment where you saw deficiencies and things. So this is a very new trend that we're dealing with, talking about grading teachers and, and you know, grading the superintendent on his school's test scores and things like that. This is a very new phenomenon in, in education. Um, just for reference, if you'll look at that sheet in your notebook, your folder there, the, I'm not going to go over this because it's too tedious. But this is what the teachers deal with all the time. The Texas Education Agency standardized testing terms. We have the TEAMS test, and then we have the TOS test, and we have the TOX test, and now we have the STAR. And all of these tests, you can, I've given you the years for them, all of these regimes of tests have been increasingly aimed at assessing the quality of the teacher rather than the quality of the student. Um, just in a, in, a, in a rather shocking uh, pace. All of these in Texas are based on the TEKS, not to be confused with the TACS. Uh, the TEKS, which are the Texas Essential Knowledge and Skills. Uh, these are, and I've, and I've taken this thank you, Pilot Park ISD, they have these assiduously listed on their website. These are just the first nine or 10 TEKS for English one, um, the list of skills and knowledges that you have, knowledge that you need to know. Or, and I just you know pulled them up and copied them there. So each of the disciplines has these. This is not the curriculum, these are just the TEKS. These are the knowledge and skills that you need. Um, Dawson, 2013 was a very big year for Texas education. House Bill 5 is something that we should all know about. Um, the, one of the major changes was the shift from uh, five from 15 standardized tests to five standardized tests in the state of Texas. Will you explain a little bit what that means? Um, will there be less emphasis on standardized testing? How, how is that going to work itself out? Is that a, a windfall for people who were saying standardized testing was getting too, too much? Well, I think it's positive for students in the sense that uh, 15 standardized tests as part of the high school experience was really just so outside the norm of what really any other state or nation would do in terms of testing students. So, um, you know, Texas had erected a system that really presented great hurdles for students. Um, literally, that, and it was never implemented. This is really a rollback of a system that was never fully implemented. But where the state was headed is that for students to be eligible to attend a four-year university in the state of Texas, a state university, they had to hit a cut score on the state's English three test and the state's algebra two test. And, uh, you know, again, if we remove all authority from the classroom and put it into a centralized standardized test and then we attach enormously high stakes to it for both students and teachers, it will change instruction, it will distort instruction to ensure success on that test. Parents looked at that and realized, for instance, if their older child had been through an English 3 advanced placement program, they were familiar with that, that it was a course designed to standards established by the college board, it was a college level course in which students had an opportunity to earn college credit. They're now faced with a system in which they're being told the state's going to administer a standardized test. It's going to be 15% of your child's grade by law, and neither you nor the teacher will see that actual exam until three years after it's been administered. So the purpose of it's being diagnostic to try to help the no. student, that, that's, and, that's... And so then parents thought, well, that doesn't make any sense, and then they started thinking, okay, so the state's test is going to cover this mile-wide, inch-deep curriculum, so where my child would have been receiving 
really perhaps you know a high quality international baccalaureate English three or advanced placement English three or just a good solid English three experience. Now you have a teacher that is going to have to. We're going to stop teaching this unit because we've got to cover all of these standards that are going to be subject to being tested. And that was true in English. It was true in geography. It was true in world history. So just that sense of inquiry and discovery and in-depth learning was being compromised. And I think parents finally realized that. And they really responded and they were the driving force in changing the high school emphasis on testing. And But what I will remind people is that nothing has changed in, third, in terms of three through eight education. We are still testing every child in grades three through eight Texas, you know, adheres to the federal standard, which requires the testing in reading and math in grades three through eight. But Texas also, you know, has decided to assess writing separately with a fourth and seventh grade test. Um, states are required to administer a science test in, in, a, in, in essence in the primary, intermediate, and, and secondary. And Texas has taken the approach again of its fifth grade science test is a test of all of the science curriculum up to fifth grade. So it goes back and picks up themes and concepts from third grade. And so again, you have fifth grade teachers, and I'll use the example in Highland Park, we testified before the legislature on this, to one of our very strong fifth grade science teachers. This is a person that has a master's in science. She's teaching fifth grade science, has tremendous depth of knowledge. She teaches the solar system in one 45-minute unit because there is so much to cover. And that's really the frustration that teachers feel in that they, the, the, the curriculum, you know, we talk a lot, a lot about educational reform. I think we should be concerned about educational deform, which has really occurred through the overlay of the standardized assessment is truly the tail wagging the dog. And so the pushback at the high school level is because parents really understood there were different models. They had experienced advanced placement, they had experienced international baccalaureate, they'd been in magnets. They're able to look and look at what universities required for admission and they're going, now why should high school impose conditions, why should the state of Texas impose conditions beyond what a university or college would demand of its students. And they just, you know, they push back. And, and I'll give the example after I presented this whole design before the rollback to parents in Highland Park. I, you know, they reacted. As I was leaving, there were a group of parents talking, and one of them said, you know, I'm gonna tell my kid to not worry about the state test. We'll just go out of state. Well, these are people that had the means to do it, but faced with a, a, just an inane system, her advice to her son was going to be, you just, you just stay in that AP program. Don't worry about that. I want you to take the advanced placement test. Don't worry about the state's test. We'll just go out of state because no one else cares about the Texas except EOC for Texas. except for Texas. Yes. And so to have the, and, and it's not that, of course, we're suggesting that children shouldn't be learning cumulatively, gathering up information, but again, yeah. to make the tests, the tests about so whether the, or not the teacher taught that material that was supposed to have right. been taught three years ago, I don't think that most people know that, that that kind of and, and that's the elementary on. science test, but, you know, certainly movement from 15 to five is a positive thing, mm -hmm. and, um, you know, that's a step in the right direction. I think it it alleviated some of the pressure. It gives an opportunity for, uh, you know, schools to have really more options in what they provide to students in terms of junior and senior year experiences. And uh, at some point, I guess you're gonna to wanna to talk about foundation programs and endorsements, yes, and, but, and that'll be a part of it. But before that, I want to ask, because one of the things that was not passed, but vetoed at the last minute, unfortunately, mm -hmm was this proposal that you helped craft with other superintendents from high performing school schools consortium. Right. I want to get the name of it right, the community-based assessment and accountability system. Right. There were four primary components to that. I remember Don Cowan's 
writing, and, and you may remember this from a few county center newsletters ago where I reported Tom, uh, Don Cowan's report on the Crest Loose Commission in the early 90s and saying if you take this thing called accountability and make this term the basis for assessing the quality of education, you're going to deform, to use your term, you're going to derail education, which is a trust-based human system. Um, your common-based assessment and accountability system, uh, that the proposal that was not accepted, has something to do with that trust-based thing. Will you talk just a little bit, what about sure. those four constituents, those things there? What was actually proposed in the High Performance School Consortium, and, and I do want to clarify, the High Performance School Consortium was an aspirational title. The 23 districts in there, the, the first law that was written that allowed the consortium to exist, we, we actually pushed back. The state wanted to limit consortium participation to school districts that were rated exemplary. And we said, a little bit of what you said, well, you know, exemplary schools can thrive under any system. If, if we want to talk about changing the system, we want it to be representative of schools across the state. So we had some districts in there that dealt, you know, that have the, the high poverty level student populations that were not necessarily thriving under the state accountability system. So what we proposed in that bill, and to let you know it was passed uh, without a single dissenting vote by the Texas House or the Texas Senate. It was vetoed by the governor. Uh, and we respect the executive authority provided for in the Texas Constitution, but we were certainly disappointed in that. What we advocated for was uh, really the key, you, you start with the curriculum. We emphasize the importance of establishing a curriculum with a, you know, there would be a few high priority learning standards as opposed to the mile wide, inch deep, hundreds of standards. All of the teaks that right. go. So step one was to really think about a rigorous curriculum, and we did advocate that we, we felt that if you were going to emphasize skills in curriculum, uh, which has certainly been you know a huge part of curriculum work, is that we wanted those skills to be reflective of what research was telling us in terms of the kids do need collaborative skills. They need the skills of cooperation. They need to be able to create and produce and use technology wisely and well as a tool for expressing their knowledge. And so we, we really favored high quality curriculum with a, a focus on what a lot of people refer to as uh, deeper learning skills, 21st century learning skills, those sorts of things. So start with the curriculum. Then what we felt that the research was very clear is that you don't have to test every student every year in multiple subjects to the state standardized test for the state to be able to ensure educational quality. So we advocated the concept of let's look at some best practices around the world and why don't we test at what are considered the gateway years. Many of the really high performing national systems around the world will test, test students at whatever their exit from primary to secondary is, if it's fifth grade or sixth grade, and then typically test again somewhere around the ninth grade, and then there's frequently then a final exit test. And in many, and in many national education systems, the final educational exit test is also the university entrance exam. You know, and so we tried to take that concept of more what we call the strategic use of standardized testing. Test at the major gateway years, and then if the state felt because it actually wanted to assess curriculum and provide guidance and research and development, do some stratified random sampling in the other grades. And you know, before we had all of this testing, there was a thing called the National Assessment of Educational Progress in which we were willing to base national policy decisions off testing fourth and eighth, fourth grade and eighth graders on a stratified random basis. But somehow that's not good enough for normal use. So that was the strategic gateway testing, stratified random sampling. Then the third part was that we said you have to shift accountability from where educators right now are accountable to state and federal bureaucracy. I mean, that's who we're accountable to in this system, and return the focus of accountability that means the most 
is the accountability that provides, first of all, meaningful diagnostic information to both students and teachers and parents about the child's learning. And then the, uh, the strongest accountability is to an informed local community that has ownership of that school. And so that was our design. That accountability would draw from the standardized test, but we were advocating that the state take advantage of the digital environment where you can now create digital portfolios. You can collect evidence of student learning around authentic work products. And I, you know, I would argue rather than a 26 line formulaic writing example yeah, as a way of that's assessing. That's my favorite part. I just right. have to interject. One yeah. of my favorite parts of the whole proposal right. was the wry way you wrote, I can't remember how you phrased it, but the wry way you wrote, and we're essentially assessing the student's writing ability by what amounts to a timed first, first draft. draft. Right. And, and that is right. supposed to be the assessment of the student's writing. So, and that's what standardized right. testing, and, and that so, limited. You know, we test. suggested, for instance, in that area, how much more useful would it be to see the student's first draft, see the feedback that the teacher or peers provided, and then how the student responded and incorporated that feedback, and then what's their final product? And in a, in a digital environment, that can be a relative, relatively low cost storage. You don't have to keep it forever. You can print it. It can be a progress portfolio, but then at the gateway transition, some of that stuff may fall off. You can give it to the parents. They can put it on the refrigerator. You know, there's any number of important uses for it. But you, you can do that. Right. And by the time students are exiting the system, you know, I mean, I, I would give much more credence to a well-written research paper or a persuasive essay that actually reflects something that the student is passionate about, that draws on something they've learned, then they're responding to an artificial prompt, you know, that is being graded by $12 an hour people who have been through a 25-hour training course, you know, with a formulated rubric. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna hold on to that position. They haven't convinced me that I'm not right. That's right. Well, and this is reiterated with the fact that, um, as we were talking the other day, uh, you were saying you all employ in Highland Park around 100 teachers every summer to go through the new TEKS standards mm -hmm. to make sure that the curriculum, the things that are being taught, that are going to be introduced, you know, that all the teachers are aware of this. So you have. You have, of course, the ability to do that because of the community in which you live, but that un incredible drain of dealing with those things, those details, instead of thinking like a teacher or an educator would comprehensively. Okay, well, let me tell you, it's actually better than that. Okay. I, mean, I mean, certainly that's a starting point that you need, to, you know, you have to take, we don't get to ignore the state curriculum, you know, so we do start with that, but we employ teachers every summer for the purpose of revising, enhancing the curriculum. They look back over their own practice. Uh, part of what we do is that we've opted to have in terms of, we don't use the state's appraisal system for our teachers. We actually have an alternative model that we've had for years, a self-directed appraisal system that is really an action learning, research learning model where teachers identify two or three questions that they think relate to their teaching effectiveness and how they can better serve their students they can work in teams. That's what they do all year. Our principals have the same model for themselves. And then we do bring teachers in every summer from the standpoint of how can we improve. We, we look at our data. We look at not only state data, but we look at the teachers' assessments of their own students. And they're saying, you know, I mean, our, our middle school recognized that, you know, kids just have a really healthy disrespect for writing conventions. You know, and they've, you know, so they've made a conscious effort to go back and to see, you know, they did, they weren't seeing the teaching of convention skills translating into writing. And so they've concentrated, revised the curriculum and revised the way they are assessing curriculum and, and you know, gathering samples and having the students put their sample into the, a share drive. And just the simple act of students knowing that their work, that they're, they're submitting it, you know, does have a healthy effect on their respect for 
some of those conventions, but our teachers don't just try to figure out the state's curriculum. No. It's how and to it's improve practice. Starting at that, but that's, but you have to start say, that's the busy work. Right. In my mind, that's the busy work. This is what I saw the department meeting yesterday at Lincoln going about. They're needing to start getting prepared for tutoring and things. Yes. Now, one of the issues, of course, is what what we do, and this is another whole meeting that we, we can just not even touch on, I think, in some ways. What do we do when we have teachers who are clearly uneducated? They themselves have not been educated. We had a superintendent stand in this room and tell a group of our teachers, the one thing you need, one of the main things you need to know is that you teachers have nothing to do with curriculum. That's what he said to them. So if we have that mentality out there and we have teachers who don't feel it's their professional responsibility to be professionally educated enough in their content knowledge and their skills so that they are themselves useful and thoughtful contributors and creators of curriculum, you have another whole issue to deal with. That's, that's another whole layer of difficulty in the public schools because I'm not in any way suggesting that we need to tomorrow turn the keys over to the curriculum in the public schools, especially the traditional public schools, to the teachers. They have been trained for decades to think that they are not supposed to think about curriculum. And so it's a very different dynamic sure. that you all have, fortunately, that you know you stand yeah. as an exemplar in that way. Well, and you, I mean, you have to provide people technical training and support for any activity they want to undertake. You can, you can have a great deal of content knowledge about a subject, but really not know very much about curriculum design. Yes. You know, so I mean, it, it is, there is a technical knowledge base associated with curriculum yes. and you have to provide it. I, I disagree with the superintendent that said that. You know, I think what you really see there is that's the manifestation, though, of a person responding to an accountability system. Yes, in and which we felt that. The assessment system has driven the thinking around how you do that. And what I refer to that is, is it's, it's, it's probably a predictable response to a, a terrible system. Because what you're really saying there is, is there's a belief that you have to teacher-proof the curriculum yes. and, and make the curriculum so specific that you can track and measure and try to control it in a completely standardized way, which ignores all of the concepts about human learning and creativity and individual differences. And, and the fact that if a teacher cannot bring the joy of teaching, you know, the reason they got into it, their love of their subject, their love of the child, and if they can't let that come through, mm. children sense the authentic and the inauthentic. Yes, they're the and, best. You know, they don't respond to that. Mm -hmm. you know, so I, I think that's sad, uh, but I'm not surprised that it's out there. Yes. You know, because we are not immune from those pressures. You know, we live in a community that says we don't care about standardized tests. We, we will believe that the day we don't do well on them as to how well that, that holds up. You know, they don't care about it because they don't assume that it's an issue. Yeah. The state's design forces us periodically to try to back up and understand and think, you know, in, in the implementing of a new accountability system, we're gonna, we're gonna be very dependent on this one group of kids, how they do on this one subject exam. You know, and we can't afford to fail because it, it, it will kill our credibility yes. in terms of all the other things that we want to advocate for. Yes. And so you have you're to, not immune from it. It's, and that's the part that to me is the most startling right. um, in 33 years of education to see this progression, I would call it a, a digression, into this mode of this is the thing that sets the standard. This is the thing that determines the value and the quality of of what you're doing in the classroom. Well, you know, the truth of the matter is you have educational policy makers that know nothing about teaching and learning, okay. setting the structure, and you know, as, as an example, I mean, we've already adopted STAR test for subjects that are about to go through curriculum revision. So, I you mean, can what's, see it on the website. So what's going to drive the curriculum? The assessment's already been constructed. I mean, that's, there's a technical term for that. Yes. <laughs> that I won't use because we're being filmed. Uh, you know, uh, but I mean, so 
there's there's a huge disconnect there. Yes. Um, and without going into all of that, I mean, we have built up vested economic interest in a testing and accountability system. Mm -hmm. I mean, a ninety-two million dollar a year testing contract in Texas. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, that's that's wild. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, I, I go back to New York's Pearson contract. Mm -hmm. It's thirty-seven million. The Texas contract four hundred ninety-two million. You know, why? Because Texas insists on changing its testing program. Every legislative session, there's a change to the testing program. There's a change to this, there's a change to that. So you, you're constantly going back. And, you know, I, I think we could really try to think about countries that actually put out the concept of this, these are the curricular standards, these are the assessment standards that we expect you to meet and then teachers design the assessments, and those assessments are available for review and inspection to ensure some sense of accountability. As they would be if real teachers of were course. actually doing their job, because that's what we do. We're, we're incessant about that. We're always analyzing and scrutinizing. And those and systems that are based off that make a huge investment in the education of their teachers. Yes. Mm -hmm. Because they recognize the content and preparation of teachers, and they provide teachers time to sit down and actually have meaningful discussions around the best way to teach a concept, how students would learn a concept, and how would you assess the knowledge and know that students have learned. So there is a better way. Instead of the teacher proofing, and that is a new phrase. I mean, that's that's not something that I recall from my early career. Um, I want to move us just for a yes. few minutes into the new graduation requirements. And you do have a little colorful sheet there in your notebook. And we're not, you know, none of this is intended for you to memorize tonight, of course. We just wanted to give you some resources. So House Bill 5 has replaced what was called the 4 by 4 graduation requirements, which was ostensibly what looked like a liberal arts curriculum for everyone, for math, for science, for English, for history, foreign language, these things with one that advocates endorsements, is what they're calling endorsements. And what page on this do we need to be, um, Dawson? I'm going to suggest the easier side is the, the, the less column, the fewer columns. Yeah, the, the, the bigger picture. Because, you know, I, I want to maybe help you feel better about this, okay? I actually don't feel bad about it, like okay. I told Mr. Miles. Okay. If everyone right. had that bright sense, and if all of these vocational courses were taught with this spirit, we could set up a uniquely American educational yeah. system. Yeah. I mean, I think the key is the quality of the curriculum that makes it up. But, you know, the endorsements, I mean, the idea right now is that, you know, students today, and I'm, let's just recognize that the, the current system is in place, it's still in place for 10th, 11th, and 12th grade. Okay, now they can opt down, but let's just, when we refer to the current system, students in the current system could still, they can still drop down to the minimum high school program, you know, and, and really bypass the four by four, and, and some students do that. The expectation is that all students would at least be in the recommended high school program. That, that design hasn't really changed. I mean, Students are expected to be in an endorsement field, which means that any of the endorsements, if you look at it, you know, do require the fourth year of math and the fourth year of science. Those are those pink five. In the, in the pink problem. five. So the idea is that you're still going to go through, and, and, and in many ways, you could argue you're still going to have the four by four, but the idea now is that that fourth math or that fourth science, you know, might be more tailored to a specific interest. And, and I don't want to move back into the whole geography community versus magnet versus charter, but I mean, one of the things that magnets do is they have a unifying theme. Mm -hmm. And you know, when people go to a magnet, they're going because they, they have expressed a commitment and interest in it, and they, they make a psychological and personal commitment to that. So kids today do want choice. Mm -hmm. And I think, our, I think our goal as educators is to give them choice within a structure that still provides quality and doesn't limit options. Because, I mean, I've seen so many kids that were going to be, they were music majors because they love their band instructor. 
And you know, then they get into about their third year of college and they realize that this is really not how I want to make a living. I yes. mean, so you, you, you want students to not have precluded, cut themselves off from future options because they were excited by something as a 16 year old. Mm -hmm. you know? and, and if I can just interject, right. the, the endorsements, those pink boxes across the middle there, as you can see, it's really just a handful of classes. It's not like suddenly everybody has become right. just what we would used to call 30 years ago a low-tech right. student. So, um, you know, for instance, STEM right now, we, we have a body of students, a limited number of students, and they've been completing the STEM endorsement without it ever being called the STEM endorsement. I mean, we go up through multivariate calculus and we've got, you know, 15 to 18 kids who will have taken three years of calculus and they'll also take a computer science AP class, and they're, they're completely immersed in a STEM endorsement, we'll now just yeah. give well, them a sticker. The certificate. You know, they'll get the, like in the Wizard of Oz, now you have a certificate <laughs> to, to do that. Yeah, that's um, but where it, you know, we, we will not be able, for instance, in looking at our curriculum, we don't have the courses to provide a coherent sequence in the public service area. Those clusters are around health occupations, things that have just not been part of our traditional college preparatory. But in terms of the arts and humanities, we have some very good courses. I think we have an opportunity, you know, don't get too excited, but I mean, we have an opportunity to create some electives that really tap into the humanities. You know, we, we offer creative writing right now. The kids have to figure out how to work into their schedule. Right. And this they, gives them a benefit. And now this gives them that in that fourth year, we might be able to tailor a, a senior experience for some students that they've already shown through their English 3 AP that, you know, they're, they're strong writers. And we might be able to actually create, a, if they're pursuing a business and industry, some, some work around, you know, technical writing legal writing, if you're going to, you know, pursue a pre-law major, you know, what, what would be some writing that might be helpful to you? So I, I think responsibly used, I see this great opportunity for customization. The danger would be if you do fall back into starting to push kids very quickly into vocational track programs. Now, the, the safeguard in this is cumbersome, but you know, students as eighth graders have to pick an endorsement. They have to go in and pick an endorsement and they can't, they don't get a chance to change until after their freshman year. And then they have to go through a pretty rigorous process in which the parent and counselor and everybody is involved and agrees. Um, and, and I would hope that most schools, what they're gonna really do is they're gonna, they're gonna really make it hard for kids to make that decision that early. Mm -hmm. you know? yep. and the, they, they've really got to work through the curriculum because they really don't start getting much choice until their junior year anyway. Right. Is there a reason for the endorsement begin? I mean, that, because that sounds like very much the British system. Um, is there a reason for the endorsement being required at that point? Is it just to get your ducks in a row with classes and things I, like that? I think it was, this, this looks an awful lot like the uh, career pathways program that was out, you know, 10 years ago before kind of the No Child Left Behind standardized testing. I think they actually looked there, I think there were 13 career pathways where you tried to, art, you know, have this articulated coherent sequence of courses that when kids graduated from high school, the idea was that they, they you know, would, some would go into college but already be a leg up or you could go into a community college and within a couple of courses receive a certification for a field and so I, I think that's a lot of the inspiration for this so I don't really think it's the English model they didn't want to call it career pathways because we're tracking or we're, like yeah that. and you it's just kind of you're just going back to a previous system but I, it, it's more akin to that than it is the British system can can you speak and I want to ask if you have any questions but can you speak for a moment about the concepts of the extremes of customization versus standardization because it seems like, in some ways, we're moving from a standardized sensibility to a much more customized sensibility. But those 
two words both have shadows as well. Can, can you speak any about that as a superintendent, about the pitfalls, the benefits, customization versus standardization? Well, I'm going to start with Louise Cowan, who a year ago, two years ago, I can't remember, it was about this time of the year when she said that, you know, we've, we've created kind of this false dichotomy of that standardization is that these are little, you know, mechanistic units to be assessed along the assembly line is the standardization over to the other extreme where I think she said something like, you know, that youth are really not the answer to their own questions, <laughs> you know, with just this complete empowering of the youth culture. So, I, you know, in terms of schools, uh, you know, s standardization, I mean, there's going to be some degree of standardization. I, I think I would have much rather seen standardization based around really good curriculum development. I mean, I, I think if the money that had been spent on assessment had been spent on research and development, around teaching techniques and the way children learn and the way the brain develops and the way kids process information, how much further along we would have been. So I would have much rather had standardization around not the best practice, but these are really sound practices based on these circumstances. They make sense. High quality work around curriculum, teaching, the research involved in that. You know, customization, I think, is important today because Phil Schlechty talks about that we used to live in a period in which, you know, when we go back to that community model, the truth of the matter is that teachers, parents, and ministers basically were the gatekeepers of knowledge. And we decided what children were exposed to, at what rate, in what way, and that was the world we lived in. Well, today, you know, the digital environment has changed that. Everyone has access to everything, and so, um, no kids will fact check. I mean, they're 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 checking you out, whatever you say, and they're going to sources. And so, you know, customization, you know, it it, it can be scary because it can be so wide open. So I think we have to try to recognize that students want choice. They're exposed to more earlier. They are. They are developing their interest earlier. I mean, we see kids that are doing amazing things as 15, 16, and 17 year olds to the point of starting their own businesses and actually doing really neat things. But, I, you know, I think customization, we still need, I'm gonna go back to the old concept of in some ways we just need that strong common core and I would advocate based around the concept of a liberal education in which we spend time, what are the enduring understandings that we want children to have, you know. Um, no one remembers the detail, other than the detail that just fascinated them, but what's the enduring understanding you want them to have when they are citizens, you know. And so, you know, standardize around that, and customize around their inter individual interests and aptitudes, but don't let them pursue their sole passion based off their 14 and 15 year old minds. I mean, you've got to give them a little broader exposure and that's what the core would do, sure. and we're still talking about the core being in place. Um, I want to ask if anyone has any question or comment before we wrap up this part of our uh, discussion, anything about the, just wanted to let you all know about these big change. I mean, these are seismic shifts uh, in education, and the endorsements concept has uh, unsettled yeah. A number of people as well. Well, and, and let me mention something to you is that there's nothing in this that required universities to change their admission standards. And so, for instance, the, the universities still are huge drivers of this process. So, I mean, the University of Texas is not backing off its requirement for math. Mm -hmm. And the other little safeguard they put in there is that if students want to compete, you know, on the basis of being in the top 10%, for automatic admission, they have to complete the Distinguished Achievement Program, which is the four by four traditional college preparatory. Yeah. So there are incentives to keep, you know, a, a little structure in place around that. And I, and I think, I guess what I would say overall is if 
we can maintain or establish an integrity of the core courses. If English one um, for the students who are in <coughs> the vocational technical courses is as enriched and rigorous and substantive as English one is for the students who are in the humanities. You know, and there's, there's nothing in this law that suggests that you can go out and revise and come up with an English one vocational track. Yes, but it's, I know, I know that that is the fear that I hear from some people that as soon as we start talking about something that looks like tracking, there's going to be developing this vo-tech vo tracking sensibility. Again, like my brother experienced where very little rigor went on and he was able to kind of float through the bottom level yeah. of the high school educational system. Well, again, you know, in terms of if you if you read it, that fourth year of math, that fourth year of science, and all of the endorsements calls for it to be an advanced course. Something more than so more some, not just a filler. And so, you know, that's where professional integrity needs to come in and and just know, the curriculum, as that. you're saying, the the quality of the curriculum exactly needs to come in. So, well, thank you okay. so much. Dawson, for your comments on that. Anybody have any question or comment? I just want, oh, Larry, you do. <laughs> of course. <laughs> um, a lot of things that you said uh, struck me, uh, Dawson, and thank you for all of it. But um, one thing in particular, when you talk about education policy makers mm -hmm. as having no experience in teaching, mm -hmm. uh, that, that seems to be a particularly sinister thing to me. Is there any sign that that hold is is being loosened, you know, where, where are we headed? How did that happen? The Berlin Wall fell, and people had to have some place to put their energy, I guess, I'm being facetious. Um, you know, that was the progression of, you know, I'm gonna be candid, I think public schools were not serving certain children well. I mean, minorities were being marginalized. I mean, there was a there was a reason all of this scrutiny and accountability came in, and unfortunately, I think what occurred is that the, you know, it was kind of this is oversimplified, but you know, if a, if a little bit was good, then a whole lot must be a whole lot better, and we, and we kind of reached whether it's the J curve or a point of diminishing returns, to where we just simply distorted in, instruction. So. You know, it, it moved into that realm because it really wasn't being attended to within the profession and within communities. And the, you know, then there's momentum and the reality of America is that it's a highly politicized process. Uh, and, you know, I, I simply think once you open that door and you create vested interest, uh, you know, it's, it's very hard to turn that system around. But I do think that that's really, you know, in Texas this past year, the real difference is, as a superintendent, the things I've said before you tonight, I have said to commissioners, and I've said to policymakers, and I've said to legislative committees, this year, it was a group of well-educated, well-informed parents, primarily mothers, who basically changed the testing paradigm because they spoke with the power and passion of parents and had the numbers behind. And so I do think that if communities are not engaged in the education of their youth, if they're not questioning and demanding and you know pushing for their child's best interest, it's very easy for the system just to run along and serve its own purposes. Uh, so is it shifting? I think. Parents are becoming better advocates. I, I, I think that there's certainly a movement for less testing. There's a, a desire to be sure that we are capitalizing on our strengths, which American education has typically been around creativity for years, and we've, we've lost some of that in the push to standardization. So I see currents that are there, but I, I still think we've got a long way to go. All right. Thank you so oh, much.